Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Australian National University for Provocations, a live interactive academic event uh, which seeks to shed light on competing visions of future sustainabilities. My name is Catherine Daniel. Uh, I'm a professor here at the ANU uh, in the School of Cybernetics and the Fenner School of Environment and Society and your facilitator for today's event. Um, before I welcome our distinguished guest for our provocation, uh, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet uh, today, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and pay our respects to their elders past and present. These are lands that have never been ceded and will always remain sacred. And we acknowledge that sustainable futures have been built here for millennia and that this knowledge and practice remains enormously important uh, to the futures we continue to create here together. For the second iteration of our provocation series, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Professor Peter Grest, who is an academic, filmmaker, journalist and author. Uh, Peter is currently Professor of Journalism uh, at Macquarie University and came to academia in 2018 after a 30-year career as an award-winning foreign correspondent for the BBC, Reuters, CNN and Al Jazeera, uh, working in some of the world's most volatile places. He was based in Afghanistan, Yugoslavia, Latin America and Africa and covered conflicts across those regions and in the Middle East. In 2011, Peter won a Peabody Award for a documentary on Somalia, Land of Anarchy, uh, for the BBC's flagship current affairs program, Panorama. But Peter is perhaps best known for uh, himself for becoming a headline um, when he and two of his colleagues were arrested in Cairo while working for Al Jazeera and charged with terrorism offences. In letters smuggled from prison, Peter described their incarceration as an attack on press freedom. His campaign for freedom earned him numerous awards, including the British Royal Television Society, from the British Royal Television Society, from the Walkley Foundation, the RSL, the Human Rights Commission, and the International Association of Press Clubs. In 2017, with two colleagues, uh, he established the advocacy group uh, the Alliance for Journalists' Freedom, which actively campaigns for media freedom across Australia and the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, Peter is also author of The First Casualty, a book about his experiences in Egypt and the wider uh, war on journalism. And as an academic, he leads a research program investigating the impact of national security legislation on public interest journalism. And we are very excited to have Peter joining us today uh, for a discussion about these vitally important topics. Now, in terms of our format today, uh, the event will begin with a provocation from Peter discussing uh, the need to reconsider the news as a public good, the flaws of the business model of journalism, the policy mechanisms which might be able to uh, bring about change and this positive future. Um, this will be followed by responses from and discussion between our provocatees, uh, Dr. Rebecca Pierce and Andrew Mears, who, whose backgrounds I will briefly introduce later, and of course with Peter. Finally, there will be a live Q&A session in which the audience has the opportunity uh, to engage with Peter's vision for a sustainable journalistic future. And I would like to note that today's proceedings are being recorded uh, for public distribution and simulcast on Zoom. So please keep that in mind uh, should you wish to engage in the discussion. And so uh, now, uh, with those brief introductions, I'd like to invite uh, Peter to give uh, your provocation to us. Thank you very much. It's fantastic to be here and talking in this forum, which I think is really, really important. Um, and I'm very honoured to be able to give this provocation. So the basic thesis is that our policies around news um, assumes that news should be treated as a business. We've ring-fenced news from government interference. We've tried to establish ways in which news organisations should be supported in their pursuit of being able to make money from news. But that forgets the fundamental problem with news and that it has never been a business in its own right. News in the old days before digi the digital disruption was always paid for by, so by 
by revenue that was ring-fenced or separate from, from news, from the classified advertising in the case of print journalism um, and from the uh, broadcast advertising that wrapped around the commercial um, entertainment, whether it was on radio or television, and that, that, and that subsidised news. <coughs> Any journalist that, um, that worked in the newsrooms prior to the digital disruption will remember, I certainly remember, times when the whole newsrooms would threaten to walk out on strike if someone from the advertising department merely happened to step foot inside the newsroom. That allowed a, a, a very clear separation between the source of revenue and the journalism. That was known in the old days as the rivers of gold. And it, it really created that sense of editorial independence and a source of, uh, of, financial, of, of finance, of revenue, to pay for journalism that journalists often described as worthy. That means the kind of stuff that's important, even if it's not that interesting. The kind of things that we knew needed to be investigated, we knew needed to be covered, even if we knew not that many people would actually pay attention to it. Because as journalists, we had a responsibility to cover a lot of these stories, um, regardless of, of the public interest. The problem now, though, is that that uh, the digital disruption has removed those rivers of gold and it's tied news directly to the source of revenue. Earlier on, it was directly connected to clicks. Nowadays, it's more about generating subscriptions. The subscription model is slightly better because it is uh, over a longer term. It means that um, supporters of, uh, and readers of newspapers are able to engage um, or to, to finance over the course of a subscription. But I was talking to an editor um, or a, a former editor of, of News Corp regional publications um, a few days ago, who said to me that at the moment, journalists um, in their regional newsrooms have their KPIs, and those KPIs are based around the numbers of subscriptions that they generate. And those journalists, when they're writing their headlines, have artificial intelligence, which will calculate how many subscriptions any given headline will help to generate. It's not a guarantee, of course, but the point is that those journalists are always nudged to producing headlines and stories that are going to generate subscriptions. And that means that you tweet things in a way that, because, of, because you needed to make money, you need to cover your job, you're producing journalism that is going to be shoutier, that's going to be um, triggering to your audience, that's going to inspire them to reach into their pockets and start poning up hard cash. I don't think that's good journalism. It tends to produce content that um, appeals to our more base instincts. It tends to produce content that's more polarising. It tends to prioritise polemic over serious analysis, speed over accuracy. Um, and I don't think that's a healthy way of sustaining the kind of news environment that we need to have. So that's a really solid argument, I hope, for not thinking of news as a business, and start instead, I think, um, or at least I think that we should be reconsidering news as a public good. Now that means that if we think of news as a public good, if we think that, if we accept that it's a part of the way our democracy works, if we accept that we need a class of professional individuals who have the skills, the time, the resources, um, and the energy to focus on investigating government, of doing deep and inquiries, um, of having the background knowledge to seriously question and challenge the way that um, our politicians and our civil service um, are, are running their, their various departments. Um, if we have people that have an understanding of the way business works, then we need to find a way of paying for that that is independent from commercial pressure or public government or, or government pressure. And I think there is a, good, there is a solid case to argue that there needs to be public funds, not just into a public broadcaster, but also into commercial news organisations. And this isn't a particularly radical idea. We already do something similar in healthcare and education. Um, in education, for example, we all as a community accept that there needs to be a basic level of service provided by the government and that the government needs to establish a set of standards um, that run throughout the private sector as well as the public sector that some money also flows to the public sector to make sure that we've got those basic standards, but that there is still a role for the public sector to top up what public money 
act, um, the basic service that public money provides. And if conceptually we accept that for healthcare and education, then I also think we, there is um, a case to argue that we should be accepting it for our information ecosystem, our news ecosystem. Um, there are all sorts of models and we can discuss how that works, what that might look like. But fundamentally, um, I still think that, that, we, that, we, that, we, that unless we're prepared to reconceptualise or rethink the way that news operates, we're going to be headed for a very difficult future. That's not to say that I think that journalists should then therefore be taking loads of public money and, and that we should be giving loads of extra cash to Rupert Murdoch. I think there are responsibilities that come with it. One of the points about putting public money into private sector means that the public that has an investment in the private sector, that news organisers or, or that journalists have a responsibility not just to their shareholders of those private news corporations, but also to the public. In fact, we can conceive of the public as a shareholder in those larger organisations. And that means that if you accept public money, you should also accept um, that you provide journalism to a certain set of standards, that you make yourself um, open to adjudication from the public um, ombudsman, that you provide journalism that fills the gaps that are left under the current system. So you make sure that you provide journalism that covers local courts, local councils, the kinds of specialist journalism that we're seeing disappearing, that you provide a certain amount of journalists who are devoted to investigative journalism. If we can manage a system, if we can re-engineer a system in its entirety that includes the business model, that includes professional standards, that includes the technical and the, the um, software environment that it operates in, then I think we're in a much better, in a much better position to create an information um, ecosystem that works not just for us as a community, but also works for our democracy as a whole. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, um, Peter. I think there's an enormous uh, amount of food for thought there around, you know, re-engineering an entire system and that, that whole ecosystem you've just um, spoken about. I'm now interested in our responses um, from our two provo provocatees uh, to get our discussion started. Our first uh, provocatee is uh, Dr. Rebecca Pierce. Uh, Beck Pierce is a sociologist at both the ANU's School of Sociology and the Fenner School of Environment and Society. Uh, her teaching and research focuses on inequalities and environmental policy. Uh, Beck's current projects investigate renewable energy rollout uh, and natural resource management, particularly in new rural New South Wales, um, with a particular focus on land and labour relations. And her other work, uh, also relevant to this discussion, uh, focuses on the political economy of climate and energy policy. Uh, she is author of Pricing Carbon in Australia and a contributing author to Beyond the Coal Rush. Uh, thank you, Beck. Great. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity to be here, Peter and Catherine and everyone involved. Um, I suppose as a sociologist, I've got, you know, parallel interests in questions of, you know, what makes good politics and, and how politics can contribute to a more just and equal society. Um, so I'm just going to start, if you don't mind, with some reflections on how we're defining the public good here particularly in relation to the state's role in our society and the constitution of the polity of Australia. So, you know, public good is a concept that we actually get out of economics, um, but it's a social science term referring to social collective goods that are usually free to access, non-excludable, um, for instance, uh, are available. If you want to click on that link, you should be able to access it. And I really appreciate where you're going there, Peter, with recognising that there is information out there important to our democracy that people literally can't access because of the failure of this business model. Um, it's also generally important, important to the, the way we do democracy and the role of the state in our lives. And I wanted to offer f a few thoughts on the role of the state already in the public sphere and what it as an ensemble of contradictory institutions <laughs> wants out of the public sphere, um, uh, particularly when it comes to the media. It, it needs to legitimate itself, needs to be heard, 
Um, it needs to secure political consent from the community uh, for the way it's governing. But more broadly, the state has a role in legitimising the current political and economic order that we live in. Um, and the media as that fourth estate kind of model that emerges in modernity is about solving or convening the state's democracy problem, giving people a way to air grievance. So we've got um, problems of hegemony, you know, power, um, and, the, and the state having a kind of role to play in some of the bad stuff as well as the good stuff, like funding things we want, like education, um, and, and potentially an expanded role in journalism. So I suppose I just want to um, move now to the, and how I think about climate change um, and the reporting and the role of the press there very briefly, and I want to come back to m models for getting the state more involved. So with climate change, we've got a fundamental contradiction, a prevailing economic and political order um, that makes Australia, you know, we're not, f we're not narrowly reliant on the fossil fuel sector, but we are certainly subservient to it politically. And journalism, um, you know, I'm thinking about work of the people in the broadsheets like Marion Wilkinson, Four Corners and so on, um, has been essential to exposing elite capture in the political process around climate. Um, but we've also had a real problem in creating popular support for the state's response to, cli response to climate. Um, and, and in some ways that's because we had a populist um, response to a market solution in the Rudd government's carbon pricing scheme, led by Tony Abbott, bolstered by Murdoch, with a kind of ax the tax, scepticism of the science and the economic instrument, um, kind of railroad um, strategy through the media into parliament, ruined a piece of legislation that we needed to really work on and arguably with to get reform going. So the, the media had a real role to play there in um, exposing the problems and, and calling the government to account. But I do think we ended up being hamstrung by the terms of a very technocratic, uh, by the technocratic or populist choice in the public sphere um, when it came to debating climate policy. Um, and, and I think the middle of Australia just switched off and the popular opinion polls show us that most people were on Reddit, on Facebook, just sort of didn't want a bar of it and stopped really engaging. And, and I suppose the question I want to end there in terms of the broader equity and bringing in a, an educated um, uh, popular polity that's not just um, people like us, but also people from the lower classes in society and lower middle class, how do we make journalism relevant um, to the vast majority of people who ended up switching off when it came to that really important issue? Um, what kinds of regulations are, are going to really hold, I think, both sides of um, Parliament and, and the new independence to account for a kind of policy reform that people understand and can get behind, because right now it feels like the media is part of a kind of technocratic process that people have switched off from. Does that make sense? So that's my, th that's my first sort of question, how do we make this relevant to middle Australia? Um, and then I'm really keen to talk about the, the nitty gritty of funding <laughs> <laughs> um, the public, uh, the private entities. Wonderful, Beck. And again, um, lots of common themes emerging there on the kinds of, of models um, for journalism, the relevance to all in, in society. And I think we're going to have some, uh, some interesting conversations in a minute.
Um, I'd now like to hear from our second provocateur, Andrew Mears. Uh, Andrew Mears is the design lead interim at the ANU School of Cybernetics. Uh, he is a Walkley award-winning photojournalist with more than 30 years professional experience uh, working at the Sydney Morning Herald. He served as the Federal Parliamentary Press Gallery President uh, and from 2017 to 2019, he served in the office of the then Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable Bill Shorten MP. Uh, Andrew joined uh, ANU as a senior lecturer in 2019 and has held roles within uh, the Masters of Applied Cybernetics teaching team, including convening the program in 2021 uh, as an educational experiences lead. Uh, he also led the design and delivery of a short course uh, cybernetic boot camp. Uh, this year and his primary research activities centre around the creation, circulation and curation uh, of images and the stories uh, we share about and with uh, technology. Uh, as an ANU industry appointment, uh, Andrew is passionate about broadening the opportunity of education and creating meaningful experiences uh, through novel research outputs. And he's currently curating an exhibition called Australian Cybernetic, uh, share, which is about sharing perspectives on cybernetic futures uh, from 1968, 1975 and today and that will be showing end of November, December this year. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you and can I first just acknowledge that I too am on the unceded land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and I pay my respects to Elders past and present and any First Nations people joining us today. Um, can I also thank Peter for a wonderful provocation. Uh, and launching us with such great insights, awareness, and industry practice, but with such a level of optimism in the face of you know, some really big challenges. And I would praise the organisers of this series to be courageous enough to, to dream up new worlds. Certainly my practice uh, since joining the Academy and is, an, is in and around storytelling, and it's really lovely to be part of this storytelling moment. And thank you too, Beck, for um, bringing your perspectives. Um, just as Beck did, questioning some things there, what do we mean by state? I kind of enjoyed where you were going with that. I, I sat here going, what, what do we mean by news? You know, what do we news, news as we know it? And certainly, uh, I see it as a combination of technical capabilities that are enabled themselves by a social process. So my background is in newspapers, and certainly the news as I see it is a bit of a late Victorian era, where we have a confluence of technologies coming together around encoding and decoding and transmission. And this certainly sits in and around printing presses, ink, newspapers, uh, and distribution networks pretty much through railways, you know, questioning these questions of power and geographies. And then this all gets challenged uh, with new forms of encoding and decoding and transmissions in the telegraph. And this is an area we find interesting in the School of Cybernetics because we can learn glimpses of the future through glimpses of the past is a, is a research method we use. And so I've spent a bit of time thinking around telegraphy. Uh, and it was fascinating to come across one of the first forms of news regulation in the world for copyright for news was in 1871 in Victoria. So we, we had Telegraph in Australia, but we hadn't been linked to London yet. This is a year away. And our politicians and the business interests of the newspaper providers are getting ready for this because it's a known entity elsewhere in the world. They know it's very expensive to gather news. They know it's very expensive to transmit and distribute news. Those problems are very familiar. <laughs> to all media proprietors today. Uh, and then now we start to see legislation, regulation enacted that we see news as property. And I think what you're putting to us, Peter, is to not just leave it there and look for these mechanisms of containing power and commodification. Um, but that was their way of addressing the monopolies coming out of news gathering organisations and obviously the, the telcos. You know, it was hugely expensive. So out of that we get uh, entrenchment of power, they form a so Australian Associated Press to get a level of bargaining and that's pretty much shaped uh, the world that I came into in the early 90s. And then I just mentioned two other lived experience around regulation legislation in this space and I th that have shaped our world. Um, I think in 1996 we have Section 230 in the United States around the Communications Decency Act and these are 23 words that enable the internet today. So this is this concept around the public good of containing free speech around some horrendous things that we know play out online and then the Facebooks of the world didn't want to be known as a publisher. And so this idea of what is enabling and constraining 
helped shape the world we're in. And then in 1999 in Australia, again, these power structures and their version of the Copyright Act, when we started to see interactive media and putting video over the internet and what we pretty much take as the internet today, uh, was meddled with by the politicians at the time entrenching what was television, what was print. And so I think that really nobbled business model, potential new growth in these new medias. Um, and I always look at the world now that I've joined the School of Cybernetics around enabling and constraining possibilities. That's certainly my practice as a photographer. I couldn't do all the things. You're absolutely constrained by what's in front of you. Uh, and then since joining the school, the best definition I've come up with to sh share with the audience, because it is vexed, uh, is cybernetics is an attitude. And I feel like just stopping there, because that's what it is. It's an attitude. But what it's looking at is, and building a politic and attitude to complex and purposeful systems and a host of precise conceptual techniques for dealing with them. And I think we could argue the media and politics are absolutely adaptive, complex systems. And certainly the attitude that cybernetics gives us to, to me is a level of hope. Because they're going to argue that the media and technologies, our buildings, our politics, they shape us and then we shape them. So through that they're coming through concept, conceptual and theory models around flows of information that informs levels of feedback and regulation through that and then what's really driving the cybernetic conversations is understanding purpose, not what you state it is but what it does. And so my provocation back to the panel that is if we take it that um, we want a public good, there's going to come a level of accountability and resource allocation. So what are the feedback mechanisms, new, existing, they're already here, what are we, what would we, what are we seeking to amplify? Um, and suppress to do that enabling and constraining that cybernetics is interested in. Great, Andrew, and, uh, and again, so many different themes in there for us to explore um, about how you know the past um, does shape our present models, what we can learn from the past to inform, create, shape those purposeful futures. Um, enabling and constraining, I, I love the couple of terms. If I can now turn back to Peter and your provocation, what do these perspectives from Beck and Andrew uh, bring up for you? So one of the things that occurred to me, in particular as Beck was talking, um, you are talking about the relationship between the public and, and government. Um, and one of the things that struck me is the concept of freedom. Um, one of the things that always underpins the discussion around journalism is the concept of media freedom. And of course, as philosophers know, there are two ways of defining freedom. There's positive freedom and negative freedom. In the discussion around journalism, it's always been the negative, it's freedom in the negative, freedom from government interference, freedom from government control. But if you th think about what the point of press freedom has been in the first place, it's, to, it's the positive freedom for the public to have access to a wide range of good quality information. And in focusing so intently on the negative freedom, freedom from government interference, what we've got is an environment that has actually damaged that positive freedom to have access to good quality information. And I think that cuts to what Beck was saying in two areas. First of all, you spoke about um, having journalism that works to or speaks to the communities that at the moment are marginalised or that are, that are just not represented that are switched off. And one of the things I think we should be saying is that if you are, that, that you need to provide diversity in your newsrooms. You need to engineer diversity into your newsrooms that brings in people from those communities, that knows what issues concern those communities, who understand those communities and who can speak back to those communities. That doesn't happen without a thumb on the scales. I mean, if we just allow the environment, if we allow the business models to work out, if we allow the marketplace to sort itself out, um, well, we've been allowing the marketplace plenty of time to work it out and it hasn't. Right? The fact is that we've got those communities that are unrepresented, not just the, the working class and middle class, lower middle classes, but um, all sorts of diverse ethnic communities which are completely unrepresented, Gen various gendered communities that are unrepresented. I mean, there's a whole raft of people that just don't get to speak through the conventional media. And I think that we need to create an environment where we say that if you take public money, then you have a responsibility to speak to those communities. And that's the quid pro quo here. That we need to understand and, 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 and emphasise fundamentally that positive freedom 
of information, of access to good quality information, um, and recognise or, or make sure that we discuss um, that the, the vital importance of that to the people who are supposed to be receiving this, the public, rather than that negative freedom from government interference. That doesn't mean that we should therefore throw out that um, the concept of government interference because that does come with risks, but it, but it does mean, I think, that we need to place guardrails um, around both, around the limits of government interference, but also limits of the way, in, guardrails around the way in which the media works to make sure that it provides the freedom that I think we, we originally wanted when we conceived of press freedom in the, or freedom of, of speech in the first place. Um, I think that there's also another issue around the relationship of journalism and politics, and I, Beck, I, I think this cuts also to what you were saying too, and that is that um, I, was, I came across a quote a while back uh, from a researcher who argued that journalism and politics are the, 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 the sine qua non of one another, where the two are intimately interconnected in ways that we don't always see and understand. And if we recognise that politics really can't operate without journalism, without the way of communicating to the public, and as you said, generating consent in the way that it requires, and at the same time, if we accept that every act of journalism ha is political, or at least has political consequences, then we recognise the way that these two things are interconnected as, as binary stars, if you like. Uh, and we need to make sure that we, that if we do violence to one, we're seeing journalism itself being undermined and degraded, then that will have an effect on the way that our politics operates. There are a few other points, but we can, let's, let's pick yeah, it from so, there. So, Beck, would you like to respond directly to, to that one around, um, around the, the challenges and the, the intermingling of journalism and politics and maybe what you've seen, um, for example, with that, the transitions in, in the climate area? Yeah, I, I was actually, on, on the question of the, the political and, and, frankly, ideological dimensions to what you're proposing, and I think it's an incredibly productive proposal. Um, I, I've been sort of thinking in two tracks, and maybe we can't quite t touch on both of them. Um, so one, in terms of the political, uh, I started to think about all the news outlets um, that I engage with, and, you know, peripherally and, and um, intimately, and one of them that came to mind was Friendly Geordies. <laughs> the YouTube comedian slash investigative journalist that is literally in the courts <laughs> with a politician who has been allegedly engaged in corrupt behaviour in the New South Wales state. And I, you know, the question is, is Friendly Geordies um, a legitimate recipient of public funding and on what terms would you prioritise that kind of journalism? OK, so <laughs> this, this also got, um, answers a, an issue that Andrew raised, and that's around the definition of, of, of journalist or, mm. or journalism. For such a long time, we've become obsessed with what Brett Walker, I think, very astutely described once as the Assange problem. Um, everyone <laughs> defines journalist, depending on whether they think uh, Julian Assange should be or should not be considered as a journalist. Yeah. And ultimately, I think that's a fool's errand. We're never going to get there. You're never going to be able to, to come up with a meaningful definition that doesn't create a whole host of other problems around who is a journalist, which is why I'm interested in taking a completely different approach. I think we should be looking at defining journalism as a process. Yeah. And in fact, this is not a particularly radical idea, it already exists in, in, in Australian law, in the Victorian Evidence Act, section 126K, which defines, which says, it starts out in the usual way that a journalist is someone who is in the business or profession of producing news, but then it goes on to say that the, the, the publisher of that news should be accountable, in brackets, through a complaints process to, an indus to a generally accepted code of conduct or set of standards. And I think that's the key that if we decide that journalism, what matters isn't the who, but it's the, it's the function that journalism plays. And that function is defined by the, by the way in which information is gathered, 
organized and processed and then presented. And it's done to a generally understood set of standards. The MEAA has a code of conduct. The press council that I sit on um, has its general principles. And all of these define what journalism looks like and what the standards should be. Now, I'm not going to say whether friendly Geordies should or should not, is or is not. What I would say is that journalism should meet those standards and it should be accountable to those standards. If, you're, if you want to be described or defined as a journalist and if you want public money, then at the very least you have to say, here are the standards that I adhere to and if you think I deviate from those standards, here is a complaints process that will hold me to account. I think that will separate out a lot of real journalism from a lot of stuff that looks like journalism, that pretends to be journalism, but just isn't produced to those standards. I think there's something really nice in that comment in that um, when we look at that process and, and take it away from the person, it means that it's also technology agnostic. And Andrew, you were talking about the importance of those sort of technological transformations and that move from uh, even, you know, the idea of cybernetics moving from the what to the how. It moves from the what, the person, to the how. And crucially, what it does also is it, it, it doesn't rule anybody out. Mm. Okay? It doesn't say that if you are not working for News Corp, then you can't be a journalist, but if you work for the ABC, then you are. It doesn't say that. It simply says that as long as you're producing work to this standard and, and you're accountable to those standards, you're fine. Mm. Andrew, what have you seen in terms of tensions in terms of making those standards and who makes them and then maybe going back to that higher level politic that uh, Beck was talking about in, in whether it's you know, elite or, or middle Australia and how, how that all plays out? Yeah, look, I, th I think we're, some of what we're discussing here, certainly having someone such as myself who's been in those exclusive newsrooms, right? So back in the Telegraph, a newsroom was a place you went to the Telegraph station and you paid a subscription and you went to the news and you read it in a room. And that's how you got the subscription model, closed access. And obviously the telegraph and the distribution models flip that and the news goes to you. And I think we're looking again, you're talking here around you know, the, the incentives now to build those subscription models and I'm thinking, oh, we're going back to a closed room and you're speaking to how do we reach new and interesting audiences. And for me, the key here is around participation. Mm -hmm. So I've sort of come to this somewhat through studies of the fake news, which I know is not this discussion, but I've the best description of that world, the conspiracy world, oh, it's participatory fiction. You get to be part of it. And there's two other threads I'd pull together here. I'd say the popularity of apps such as TikTok allow you to participate and distribute and have a level of creativity. So I think there's now an awareness of how these things are made. So therefore, there's an opportunity to express yourself, but there's also a, a, a critique going on because you understand some of the process. Uh, and the other is the IKEA effect. And this is some you know, academic studies in around that if you build it yourself, you sort of, it has more value. Although well, it's cheap furniture, it's fabulous, I have some. Um, but the fact that you did something to bring that into the world. And so I'd be picking up on these, these points here and I, I, I agree with the accountability and responsibility framework and where that threshold sits, you know, it's never going to be perfect, but at least there's something's being asserted here. But I just love tying this together around how do we have a more participatory democracy democracy, right? And so I know that happens with a democracy sausage once every three years. This goes back to a high court implied freedom of political communication. That was certainly an argument I used to improve media access in Parliament House was I have a role to inform the public so they can vote on the way you've behaved um, or the policies you have. And so I've been looking at with this framework you're putting forward is to act act actively increasing participation. And, and I don't think what I'm proposing, particularly around a definition, actually limits anything. I mean, one of the keys and one of the things that we've really been struggling to come up with is a model that doesn't inhibit freedom of speech, that doesn't say to anybody that you can't participate in some way. What we're simply saying is that if you are produ the, the, our community, our democracy, our, our public debate really depends on access, on the flow of, really, of information that we can the base, done to, produce to a basic standard that we know and understand and that we can rely on, um, and all I'm trying to do is, is, to, is to ring fence that information. Anybody who is capable of producing, who understands those systems and processes and who is accountable, prepared to make themselves accountable to them, can, I think, be defined as producing journalism and get the benefits, whether it's public money or other legal protections. Um, but that doesn't mean that if you're not up to those standards, you can't produce content. 
You know, you can still do it. There's nothing that says that you can't. It's just about saying, that, working out a way in which we can say that this is journalism and this is everything else. Um, and you can again still be producing factual content. I'm not saying that you can't. I'm simply saying that we, we need to work out a way of recognising, of acknowledging and supporting the role that journalism plays and we do that by defining the way in which informa information is processed to a particular standard. And I think that gives us a really solid starting point that doesn't rule anybody out, doesn't in inhibit anybody else's freedom of speech, but does help create a kind of professionalised class of information that we, that we can at least place a bit more stock in than we currently do. And so I think you know that's a it's a it's a very solid proposal you know one part of the puzzle but it's only one part of the yeah. puzzle you talked about in 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 the provocation. Um, I wonder whether we also talk about um, some of the the other challenges uh, in terms of the conflict that arises through that, um, which perspectives uh, are put on show, you know how how that public good is defined, how broad is it? Is public good in Australia also public good in the whole Asia Pacific region? Is it global public good? Where does that, where are the challenges of that model? What have you seen through your practice in the past? And I might actually put this to all panelists. What kind of conflicts do you see in the past that have been really important that you think need to be managed in this, in this new model? Which ones need to thrive? Oh gosh. I think Beck had some thoughts on this. Yeah, I, I could start us Beck, off. Yeah. Um, it's a habit of mine, do you have to excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, sort of another angle I have on this is, if you like, thinking about um, the political economy of market goods that are also public goods like carbon credits, um, trees in the ground on rural land, uh, renewable energy credits and so on. But, but thinking about the, the current um, state's role in another public good we call education, I think one of the challenges we've seen in the education sector in Australia is that it's clearly a public good, but it's delivered on an extremely marketised basis and in a profoundly unequal way. We put per capita far too much money into private schools and into the um, selective state schools compared to the, the vast amount of need in the public system. So there's a kind of segregation along not just class, uh, but also racialised and ethnic lines when you think about um, the, the education system from childcare all the way up to universities. And, and the, the, the way marketisation has played out there has a long, complex story depending on which part of our education, and let's include TAFE here in um, post-high school training sector, you're looking at. Um, one of the worries I have in my head about this proposal in the real politic of a, let's face it, Labor Party and Teal coalition that might get this up, is that it, it would become, um, it would start to widen out the case for uh, the SBS and the ABC, that it would actually be read by our current government's tendencies in this area to deregulate an already establish public good that does have those content and quality regulations around it. In the TAFE sector, we've seen, um, you know, deregulation of vocational training dramatically atrophy um, access for working class people into an enormously important education institution there. And we've got problems in the user pay system in higher ed, for instance. So I'm, I'm so behind this, but I wonder you know, what strategy would be needed to make sure that this is actually an expansionary <laughs> budget line that doesn't de accidentally deregulate existing public broadcasting? For a start, so I don't think it should be a budget line. You know, yeah. What I'd like to see, I think the, the, the British licence fee model, the BBC's licence fee model is actually a fantastic way to go. For those of you who don't know, the licence fee, um, the British, anybody who owns a television in, in, in the UK pays a licence for that, t that TV, and that license fee money goes directly to the BBC. It, it's independent, it's collected by an independent license fee commission, and it goes directly to the BBC. The, the government doesn't touch it, it doesn't go anywhere near um, the Chancellor's pockets. Now, I'm not suggesting we should introduce a license fee into Australia, but if you can think about it conceptually, 
what it does is it creates um, a source of revenue for the BBC that is independent of commercial pressure or, or government influence. It's also completely transparent. Um, it's tied to the way that people consume the news and, it pun fun it's, uh, and, and entertainment. And it's premised on a public understanding that we need to pay for this for the, pub for the broader public good. I think conceptually there, there are other ways. I'm not a tax expert, mm. but I think there, are, there would, would be ways in which we can create a levy <coughs> or a form of taxation that can be collected by an independent commission and distributed. The vast bulk of it can go to the ABC and the SBS. We can still recognise and support and fund that. But if we can also gather enough extra money to, there, to also underwrite a certain amount of the production costs of commercial news, so that we've got a public investment in those newsrooms, mm -hmm. then I think you have a model that works because that also creates a line of accountability mm -hmm. from, the, from those commercial newsrooms directly back to the public that they also serve, rather than a, the, as it stands at the moment, which is a line of accountability up to their shareholders and, and yeah. company directors. Mm -hmm. you know, I was just going to jump in and to where the cost of not building on our democracy mm -hmm. and these information flows. And you mentioned models for us to consider around you know, the public funds going to health and education. And I'm sitting here thinking possibly two of the most wonderful things in my life and my family's life to be involved in have been sport. And so community sport, to go to your point, you know, the, 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 so many sports do and don't get funding. And I'm also mindful that the big sports that we know and love, the AFL, the NRLs, get significant stadium and other funding flows to them. But then there's a, you know, community cohesion, the spectacle, the health benefits flow through, so I'm thinking I'd love you to add those to your list. And the second one, I think, is something around those times of crisis. We're certainly seeing that with you know, the work you're speaking here around, we know we're going to increasingly get frequent and severe floods at the moment, fires are very much always been part of our increasing life. And so we have invested significant funds of, of mitigation and we're going to have to do a whole lot more. And certainly within that, I think there's that community sense of cohesion that comes out of that through Rural Fire Service, CFA and those moments. And so I think there's, like, what's the tapping into those communities? And I think I live in a rural part of New South Wales and we sort of talk to each other when, to notify where the speed cameras are. But we could absolutely extend through chats, doesn't have to be a published model, but it's not necessarily a subscription model, but it's a community model. And how would that be enabled through training, success models, and you're going to get that whole diversity of you know, me playing footy with the kids through to, you know, my journalistic heroes such as you, Peter, and many others who, who are the Olympic level elites, right? And so I think your model allows for this participation and the many plurality voices that we were speaking to. And so if we, if we take that point, Andrew, you know, working right from the community level, we're talking about the, you know, what happens at the grassroots. Um, we've been talking very much about what happens at sort of the, the government level. But one of the challenges we have is that the people in those grassroots communities will often be, say, connecting through Facebook or Twitter or other types of um, social media. They may not be going through the traditional media, the algorithms that they use for their search to see, do I have a pothole in my road or is it going to flood, may be giving them other information. So how do we move up, you know, when we're now in a global news ecosystem, what are the kinds of challenges and issues that we need to, to bring to the table to support this kind of proposal, to make sure it actually functions, because we, we're not cut off, we're not just in Australia. Um, how, how do we make that part of this function? Maybe Peter and, and Andrew to start with. All right, well, the one thing I, I would say is, that, uh, again, I, I think we need to acknowledge the genius of the software engineers who've created the social media systems. They have been ex incredibly efficient, incredibly good at doing what they were paid to do, and that's to monetize our attention for the profits of their shareholders. And I mean that sincerely. I think we do need to tip, uh, tip our hats to, to, to the work that they've done, but we also need to recognize that those systems, those platforms have become so ubiquitous that they now take on the status of, of utilities in our country. They're the means by which we communicate, you know. Whether <laughs> we like it or not, that's how we, that's how we find out about the world and that's how we communicate and talk to one another. But they're not designed and engineered for us or for our community. They're designed and engineered for those, those platform, those companies, those tech companies in Silicon Valley. And nobody, I think, has seriously grasped the nettle and said if, if, if that's the case, it's not useful to us, it's not helpful to our community, 
It's not helpful to public discussion. It's not helpful to the, the healthy flow of information to have the algorithms designed in that way. We need to place regulations, guardrails around the way in which those algorithms work so that they function for us because they are so ubiquitous, because we are so dependent on them. That's not an easy discussion to have. It's not a discussion that I'm seeing happening at any serious level, but I don't think we're going to solve this problem without that. And to go to your point, Andrew, too, one of the reasons I'm really happy to be here um, as a host of the School of Cybernetics, uh, um, as a, sorry, as a guest of the School of Cybernetics, is because I think the cybernetics approach that takes into account not just the financing or the business model for journalism or the standards of journalism, but the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, the way in which information flows and feeds back to its, back into the system, the whole system itself is fundamental to the way in which we should tackle this problem and, and ultimately solve it. I think we have to re-engineer, re reconfigure, um, and frankly provide a degree of regulation around the way in which the algorithms operate. I know there will be a whole load of libertarians who will scream up and down and say, but you're just giving an excuse for government interference. I disagree and I think you know, we need to place road rules. We need to stick regulations. You know, we told the car companies that they had to build in seat belts and speed, um, and, and we had to have speed regulations and we had to give them braking standards and emissions controls and so on. And the, automotive um, companies all screamed and said, oh, it's going to produce cars that are too expensive and no one's going to buy them. Well, guess what? We all accepted that we need these things for the public benefit. And I think we should take the same approach to the way in which social media operates. Yeah, I mean, I, I do sit here, with, when I hear algorithms, sometimes I just, to make my life easier, I just swap it out for a recipe. And I'm like, yeah, that recipe is not, you know, I don't want to eat that, I don't feel for that. and so. And I also sit here squirming a little bit because the world we live in is partly because of the conversations around cybernetics. So you have this coming together of information theory, control theory and automation. And it's somewhat those conversations come together and help inspire computing. But it did sit at a time of a politic after World War II and weapons manufacturing and they're worried about the automation of weapons, you know, something we still talk around today. And it came out of a crisis and it was trying to challenge that around the purpose and what are we optimising for. You know, we're just seeing, you know, horrendous genocide at that time and like really, do we really want to make better weapons to do that more efficiently? And then some of those conversations drift and become artificial intelligence because that bit they can do and they wanted to, you know, build better effectively surveillance tools for Cold War. And then now those, those tools developed in 1956, you know, many decades of work are sitting on my kitchen bench listening to my family. Um, and so I do shift awkwardly, saying cybernetics helped create that, but I also am optimistic to say, you've, thank you for your generosity here, Peter, because that's certainly what we believe in the school, that by changing the boundaries, looking at what is actually happening, and asking some, as you have today asked, some tricky questions to open up new possibilities, will create those possibilities. And so in doing that at the school, we look at people, technology, environment, absolutely intersected and, uh, and involved. And I think this question around, um, I've, I've sort of viewed the world a little bit through maintenance, high maintenance and low maintenance. And I think what you're asking for here is with a little bit of a catalyst around a new, ad, new attitude, a new way of thinking, and yes, there's probably some funding and opportunity there, new things will emerge. And then it will become a lower maintenance and a better polity and democracy is kind of the, the optimism that cybernetics had back post-war. And I, I'm, I, you know, I applaud you for being brave enough to, to bring it to us. <laughs> but to be clear, none of this is easy. You know, I, I, I recognise, and again, I think Beck might have some thoughts on this, you know, you talk about hegemony, you talk about the way that power structures work, and I recognise that there are all sorts of deeply difficult challenges to this, which is why, actually, I think it's great to be able to sit here in a, in a session called Provocations and just chuck ideas out there that I know are going to get, end up with a whole load of resistance, but at least we need to stick them out there. But Beck, you know, again, you might have some, some thoughts on... Yeah, I'm the resident Nelly negative. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's not because I'm not on board. Um, uh, I, think, I think that there are some big political dilemmas ahead if this were to become a popular idea. Um, 
Uh, but, I, but if I can just reflect like what, where I think we've landed here. So, you know, we're, we're talking about an issue that's too important not to do something about. And I really appreciate that you've started us off with that sort of flavour of claim. That we are looking at the fourth estate atrophying before our eyes in terms of its capacity and the capacity of the polity to hear it. And, and I think in the really positive sense, there's a kind of vision that you're offering us that's saying, you know, this is, this is the classic economist argument in some ways. The, the market for journalism has failed to provide a quality product and we've got all these other goals for the polity in terms of participation, creating new institutions to bring new people in, dealing with questions of diversity and representation. Um, and I think, you know, we need a more internationalist <laughs> media scape as well. We're so parochial in so many ways. I think the one thing that I'm still sticking with me is that question of political scrutiny um, and, and, and ideology in all of this. I'm thinking about uh, the forms of journalism that we want to help make, we want to make sure they maintain their place in this order and if you got your way would they be undermined and thinking of the crikeys and maybe not the friendly geordies but maybe the smaller places that do that important um, political education on the left and sometimes on the right that might you know what do we what do we do about them but I really hear a very positive vision for a range of things that could be achieved with this model. Thank you, Beck. Mm. And I, I realise that you know we've we've got about half an hour left, and I'm I'm really keen to also open up this discussion. You talked about participation, Beck, and I think uh, mm. it would be great to get our, our audience, both in the room and online, to participate a little bit in in this debate. Um, so, in terms of moving to our Q and A, um, if you can raise your hand or submit your question uh, through the online, I believe we had someone who will read out our online questions. Is that correct? Great, and we'll we'll open it up to, to questions. So we've got there we go. So we've uh, got an online question. So we'll start with that one, and this goes to just literally what we were just talking about. So with changing media landscapes, it's not just media cults or big publications creating content, but small and big influencers who use free media platforms to create content. They have a lot of influence in society and can swing people's perception in either way. On one side we have freedom of expression and on, on the other side we have the idea of control over content for public good. So who decides what is in the public good, politicians, corporations or people? That's a great question and it's a really, really curly one. Um, I'd prefer to dodge the issue altogether. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I think, again, if we go back because there, there will always be, and I think there, ne there necessarily has to be a, a debate, a, a conversation around what, um, a dynamic conversation, and by conversation I mean between consumers and producers of, of, of content, um, around what constitutes information in the public good. What I'd prefer to do, as I said, is set a set of parameters, a set of standards of the way in which information is processed. And if we accept that journalism is by definition, has a commitment to accuracy, to fairness, to balance, um, that it has, it works within um, certain legal parameters around defamation, um, then I think we can allow that debate to play out um, between, as that sort of dialogue between consumers and producers. But fundamentally, if you're holding to those basic principles that, that occur, that, you know, that are on countless news organisations, websites, that is part of the MEAA. Those codes of conduct are well known, well understood. Um, and the key is, is not just that you, that you adhere to those codes of conduct, but there is a system of accountability to that. Then I think you're in the place that you need us to be. I think there will be, I think it's very difficult for, for anybody to preset those parameters to say that this is what the public good really is. I think we need to be able to say that this is how you need to be able to process information. And as long as you're doing it in that way, according to those standards, and you're accountable to those standards, then we should let the system work 
as it will. Anything more than that starts to get, I think, a little bit too prescriptive, d dangerously prescriptive. And in fact, it comes back to your comment about the interaction between democracy and media and that, that, that yeah. feedback plays out and to just let that particular feedback do its job is, I think, a really interesting one. Did either of you have any comments on that question as well? Sometimes I, I draw on uh, the phrase, two turntables and a microphone. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, you know, in, in studying the history of hip hop, you know, you have a confluence of things coming together again to create a new emergence. Sorry to be so optimistic here, Beck, but... Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> so that, you know, there's a part of a song that's really, oh, that's a good bit to dance to. And then they found with a certain type, a particular type of turntable from Japan that happened to be a, on the sale at that, at that time enabled you to extend the break with two records so you can dance for a little bit longer, get the scratch down to your MC. But then sitting all around that, there's a whole lot of politics, gang violence, um, riots, which mean turntables are now widely available and... You know, this whole hist social history that's enabling that. But where I'm going with that is that, you know, we get a new genre, we get a new form of political expression and opportunity for some of the things we've been talking around, who has voice, who has influence. And that was a distribution of a set of tools, but more than that, it's a, it's a, it's a, a feeling, a vibe, and a connecting to an audience that wanted something. So part of my optimism sitting here today is, you know, how do we open up the two turntables and a microphone in this, and it's not necessarily, I know there's clear definitions around public good, but it's not good or bad, it's, it's the fact that it's their human endeavour and people connecting and building networks of trust to deal with the misinformation and enabling that. And I think to this point that, you know, we, we index the platforms at the moment, but I'm mindful that those things emerge and evolve and change. And so I guess it's looking at increasing participation, barriers of entry, and skill development. I think a lot of what you're speaking to, if there's these yes. accountability mechanisms, well, there's a whole education piece and, and, and um, do better. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I really appreciate the question and where this has gone because um, my, my sense is that the parameters of public good journalism model is, will necessarily be set politically. There's no avoiding it even the independent bureaucratic body is political, right? Um, uh, and it's basically the best model we have for managing the allocation of public funds to public goods, usually in a market setting these days, to give us aged care, give us the, um, disability care, give us higher ed and, and so on. And I think that um, the task is to build a, like, a popular hegemony for this kind of model that, that is defensive on the question of the ways those political decisions can end up hamstringing the new institutions and depoliticise them. That's been the problem in the charity sector. I think to some extent it's been in the problem in the university sector looking at the way the education minister has done captain's calls on ARC grants. So the you know, if you take this to Parliament, and I hope you do, and I'll <laughs> be part of it, right? I, it needs to be popular. There will be some thinking to do about that juggle that our question has thrown up between freedom of expression and having to make allocative decisions that are basically political. Um, and I'm interested in the outcomes. Excellent. If it gets through to Channel 10 and 9. <laughs> I'll jump in there. So that's the other thing. I'm sitting here as, you know, the, the debates I had to sit over as president of the press gallery, it was about keeping that wall very high for other entrants. And we're talking major yeah. players who are part of our ecosystem now. There was a lot of internal resistance from my associates around not letting people get access. Yeah. Because there's, they're protecting business models and vested yeah. interests. So, yes, that's a very real point to put forward here. And it's a, it's a tough market getting tougher and they're going to defend it. And I think that goes very nicely to some of the things also in Peter's book, but we can come to that. I'm, I'm aware that we, we should be asking our audience more questions. Uh, so do we have others up there? Yes, we have one in the, in the floor, if you'd like to uh, hand the microphone. Hi, Andrew Podger, former press council member. Um, I, in a sense, Peter, you're putting forward as a provocation, a radical change, but in a sense, you could get there through a series of incremental changes. And so I was wondering whether you might talk about, on both the, the 
issue of uh, the public interest journalism that's lacking funding, what things have been in play recently that could be built upon further to open that up with more money from, from government? And secondly, on the standard side, uh, we've seen some moves on this a long time ago, and is it an opportunity to reopen those about a platform neutral uh, professional standards framework that might be uh, a single national body of some sort? So, thanks Andrew for those questions. I think they're really important. But the question of funding, um, I think we've, there was the news media bargaining code, which we saw introduced a few years ago, which compelled um, Google and Facebook to negotiate directly with news organisations to pay for the services that they provide. Um, I think that model was deeply flawed because I think it entrenched the status quo. It did nothing really to change the fundamentals of, of our media environment. Um, <clears throat> it was also deeply unstable. It only Those agreements only existed for um, a couple of years for a relatively short period, and I think that's now having to renegotiate that. And Facebook is now talking about moving away from away from news. Excuse me. Um, and I think we and so I think we need to recognise that that system needs to be rethought. There was also the regional um, news fund that uh, was supposed to provide finance or, um, to regional news publications. Um, that would give them a longer runway to develop business models. Again, I think that was deeply flawed because it, it assumed that all we had to do was to give those news organisations time to figure it out and ultimately they'd work out a business model. My feeling is that we haven't seen that work pretty much anywhere in the world, a proper business model for journalism that's both scalable and reproducible um, in a way that, that gives me any serious hope. There are a few sort of small examples around the world, isolated examples, but nothing that says that here is a, a sustainable, viable model for the way forward. But what those experiments have done is, is started with the assumption that we have a crisis, that we need to find ways of putting money back into journalism that um, isn't connected to the traditional way of, of tying it to advertising. And so that presumption, that started, that, that fundamental acknowledgement of the problem, I think is a very good place to start. It's a recognition that actually the system's broken and we've got to figure out a way of getting more money into it. Um, and that's why I think if we start looking at, at, at a licence fee model that applies or that's, that can be distributed across all of um, the news industries according to formula, we can thrash out um, over public and political debate, then I think we might be getting closer to a model that, that's viable. Um, and also, curiously, the, the Scandinavians have a, have a, have a, a model, too, of, of public funding for, for, for regional news that I think is also worth looking at. And we don't need to go into those, that, that level of detail here. You also raised the question of standards. Um, and like you, I'm a member of the Australian Press Council. And there are two standards associations. There's a press council that deals with print and there's the and there's ACMA, the Australian Communications and Media Authority, which deals with broadcasting. And I think we've understood that both of those are frankly dysfunctional. Um, the press council itself is going through all sorts of internal inquiries and reviews to figure out how it can be better and more relevant. Again, I think those reviews haven't really been working, but they do, it does acknowledge that there's a problem. These days, having two separate standards for print and broadcasting is meaningless when news publications are, are, are running video and, 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 you know, when we're getting convergence. I mean, that distinction is just ridiculous. So what my organisation, the Alliance for Journalist Freedom, has come up with is a model of voluntary certification. And the emphasis has to be on voluntary. It cannot be compulsory. What we are saying is that, and again, this is not a radical idea. There are all sorts of professional associations out there, whether it's the um, Australian Institute of Company Directors or the Institute of Chartered Accountants or the Institute of 
um, or the Royal College of Australian, Royal Australian College of Surgeons, or the Institute of Engineers, or whatever, where, <coughs> where you have a professional organization, association organized by the industry that sets standards, that has a membership, and that says that if you want to, if you go through tests, if you go through professional development, um, we are prepared to give you a badge that says, or a label that says that you are a certified member, a professional working to our standards. Um, and I think it's way over time for journalism to do the same. And I can see several ways in which that would provide real benefits. If you could use that set of standards um, and allow certified journalists to stick something like Twitter's blue tick next to their, next to their byline, then you've got a way for the public to recognise or to make a distinction between work that is produced according to those standards and work that is not. Um, in, and also in the way that the blue tick works, that you give the social media companies a way of identifying journalism that is produced to those standards and boosting that content up the rankings in a way that allows greater engagement but also, potentially, greater revenue. Um, and I also think there's a third potential benefit. In our country, we do not have any explicit protection for media freedom anywhere in our legal code. It's implied there are all sorts of areas where it's understood or it's hinted at, but there's nowhere where it explicitly says that we have that uh, there is a um, a vital role for free media in our in our in our democracy. I think that there is time for a media freedom act that gives us that protection, mm -hmm. but the act can be defined according to the process of journalism that I've described to you already, and if that process is the same process that a certification system uses, then you can have a, a way in which those certified journalists enjoy a rebuttable presumption under the law that they are working as journalists. So in other words, if you find yourself in court and you have a certification, um, then it's up to the opposition, oh, sorry, to the prosecution to demonstrate why you have failed in your professional obligations um, under the law and therefore you don't deserve the protection or the benefit of the law. Now, that's not to say that journalists who are not certified can't get the benefit of the law. They've just got a bit more work to do to demonstrate that they are working. So the, bur the burden of proof rests on them to show that they're working to those standards. What I'm proposing here is a system that, of, that gives media um, the, the protection, the kind of legal top cover that recognises the principle of a free press, the importance of a free press. I'm, establish I'm proposing a system of certif voluntary certification that gives journalism um, a way of defining and, and professionalising its standards and allowing the public to identify that and a way of connecting those to a Media Freedom Act and certification in a way that has real benefits. Um, and I think if we can tie that model with a coherent system for financing journalism through a, a system of public funding, then I think you've got a, a coherent ecosystem or an architecture of what good journalism looks like, how it's paid for, and its connection to, to the law. It's a really big vision, um, but it is a kind of, I, I, I hope that it, it, it presents a vision of a kind of comprehensive, coherent system that deals with all of these different elements. And it, it is indeed a big vision. I don't know how many questions we have online at the moment. I think we've probably only got time for one uh, additional quick question, and then I'd love to move to our, our final wrap-up. Sure, and this actually goes just to exactly what we were just talking about as well. So um, they have said, is public funding um, the state putting its thumb on the scale to fully or partially determine the outcome in markets? Do we really want the state to determine what is journalism and what is just mere public comment? Um, have we the democratic institutions in place to ensure this won't just entrench the existing power structures in the media and exclude the type of innovation that Andrew was talking about before? Andrew, would you like to have a bit of a, a go, quickly? Yeah, I mean, it's, I was just reflecting on the answer from P there and his very comprehensive mm. model. Uh, and to the, the question before was around, uh, we turned to a science fiction writer called William Gibson, uh, and he said in an interview once, the, he said in an interview once, the future is already here; it's just unevenly distributed. <laughs> so I think, although this provocation is bold, 
and wonderful. I would like to say that the future is sort of you know endlessly deferred and we never arrive. It's certainly that the journalistic tone is often that some sort of hypothetical may happen if only these set of conditions come to fruition. And my political friends are always talking about a future that never arrives. But I want to go beyond that um, with with this provocation and this question to say that I think Peter's model uh, will form uh, in what if it is iterative or even just accepting the idea, it will form a level of change that will, in a cybernetic sense, absolutely influence and change those power structures because you've, you've, you've changed the environment. Mm -hmm. And in cybernetics, there's always in this adapt adaptiveness to responding to that environment, but also changing that environment. So this is the fact that we've been having this discussion and realising that there are other possibilities and in questioning those information flows um, with new uh, ways of being and seeing in the world, new attitudes, some will come of it. So I'd say rather than it arriving fully formed and perfect and impervious to change, it's no change is going it's, to, it's going to happen anyway because of the, the, the economic models we've discussed. But I also, having spent so much time in Parliament, looked at that's an institution and a politic that's been around for a long time. It too, um, as you articulated, needs this press. So I think there's an, there's an interest here uh, around these political decision makers. They're going to pick what's cosy for them. Uh, and so I think addressing that in your model to both be provocative and supportive of an ongoing democracy, um, I'd like to think that that happens because, yeah, you know, it's in the voters' interest. Great. Well, in that case then, I think what I'd like um, to, if we just close with a few final perspectives, so I might actually go in reverse order. Um, Andrew, would you like to give a few closing remarks, something that's come to you through this, maybe even, you know, if there was one thing that we could potentially a change or go out and do today, what might that be? Uh, I've just really enjoyed the fact that this is actually possible, right? Like, the last pro provocateur guest was Cathy McGowan, who before the election, spoke around the possibilities of there being 10 or more independents, and well, that came true. And so I'd like to think that by, just by talking <laughs> about it, it comes into existence, so well done you, Peter. Um, so I think, yeah, the fact that we're, we're attentive to it, and it is now, in our studies, we talk about a system of interest, right? We're paying attention to it, so if it somewhat manifests itself um, through that. So I think, you know, I think I've really enjoyed the fact that there is an opportunity here to, to participate, not just in media creation, but uh, in, in that whole system that Peter has put forward here and I think you know together we there is possibilities here. Excellent thank you so much Andrew. Beck. Yeah um, yeah thanks so much for this conversation um, and for the hope. I, I think just just thinking about the future like we in, in, in the context of climate change the future's here we're in an unstable world and there's lots of opportunity actually to bring Peter's ideas, I think, into the problems that are just, I think, felt top to toe by everyone in Australian society right now. People are, you know, they really did look to public institute, public broadcasters like the ABC during the pandemic crisis, the bushfire crises, the floods. Um, people know that those big media corporates aren't serving them, that they're basically addicted and anxious in the online um, mediascape that they're logged into. So I think that this is a really timely, forward-looking um, path to a future that's here in terms of having a set of ideas that the state will need at, at its fingertips when it's dealing with some pretty turbulent times unfolding. So thank you for bringing a very timely set of positive public good ideas because we only need more of them at this point in history. Well, thank you, and thanks for having me once again. Um, and I just want to very briefly address the question that we had a moment ago, and that's that I don't necessarily think, it, again, as I said earlier, we give be too prescriptive around what counts as public interest and, and, and comment and so on. The point about government, and again, I'm not a government expert here, but my understanding is to establish the guardrails, to establish the limits of behaviour and to allow space within this stuff in which we're in which we can have this kind of comment and debate. But I'm just very keen to establish a degree of professionalism around that journalism um, in a way that sets it apart and distinguishes it and provides upward pressure um, in a way that we don't currently have. I'm under no illusions that any of this 
is easy. One of my, my partner um, is a communications uh, consultant and, and an expert, and she keeps reminding me that journalists are on the nose. You know, <laughs> the public uh, view of journalists is right down in, in the toilet. Um, and I recognise that that's, that's a very serious problem because we don't have, at the moment, the political pressure from the bottom to create the kind of changes that I think we need to create. And that's where I think um, the, the news industry itself um, has a responsibility to up its game, to improve its relationship with the community that it needs if it's going to get the kind of regulatory change to help it survive. I, I think that's absolutely vital. Um, but having said that, I also think we recognise that the system fundamentally isn't working. All of the, the, the fact that I'm here, as you said, is a recognition that we need to be having these conversations. The fact that we've had um, inquiries in the past, um, after the AFP raids in 2018, or 2019 rather, um, which made a whole host of recommendations for sweeping reform, even though most of those recommendations weren't implemented, acknowledges the problem is that the system is broken and is in need of fixing. The fact that we've, there's discussion now about um, parliamentary inquiries into um, the concentration of media ownership in this country suggests that people acknowledge the system is broken. The fact that people are cynical of, of journalists and the media and news corporations generally is, I think, again, an, a very explicit acknowledgement that the system isn't working. And so if we can at least acknowledge that, um, then I think we're in the path. And if we acknowledge the fundamental importance of this system, to the way in which we work, not just in the news business or political business, but in the way in which our community operates, then I think we are at least taking those first steps towards the kind of radical change that I think ultimately um, is, is in the ideas that I've been proposing. Well, thank you so much uh, to all of our, our fabulous presenters. Um, these events do not run themselves, um, and I have a range of people to thank uh, at the conclusion of this event. Um, firstly, Flynn Shaw and Kate Andrews for the development and management of the event. Uh, many thanks to the School of Cybernetics Engagement team, uh, McCoy, Sharice, Jackie, and the Fenacoms team, Rosie and Pete, uh, for promoting and helping to run this event. Uh, thank you to Elite uh, Event Technology for their help in filming and recording the event. And a big thank you to the ANU School of Cybernetics and Fenner School of Environment and Society uh, for the ANU Futures Scheme uh, grant, which this event series had its genesis. Uh, finally, and of course, the biggest um, thanks must go to Peter for his time and enthusiasm and provocation sharing these amazing models with us, and to Beck and Andrew for playing the role of our provocatees. Uh, thank you to the audience, uh, both in person uh, and online, uh, for your questions, participation, and being part of this conversation. Uh, as Peter has outlined, um, journalism has played and continues to play a vital uh, role in so many aspects of our lives and political uh, lives and democracy and it's really important that we continue um, to consider how to best maximise the value of the unique position um, that it holds in our society and how it can help us to create uh, more responsible, safer and sustainable futures. Thank you. <laughs>